So I want to say a little bit about indigenous land titling and mineral extraction wars in Australia. Um, and I want to begin with um, a story about when I went uh, to Arnhem Land in the 19, uh, late 1970s and I found I found that people, um, indigenous people, they actually mined. And um, just to link to your story about the range, rainbow serpent, uh, in this case, people are mining uh, for white pigment, or delic, which is the, um, the um, excreta or, or shit of the rainbow serpent. And, um, oops. That's what it looks like. This is material that people use um, in ceremony, in art, and this is material that people also ingest when they have uh, dietary uh, problems, when they have stomach upset. It's actually kaolin. It's a very fine uh, huntite. That sort of mining, community mining, is very different from industrial mining. And this is a picture of a mine um, in eastern Arnhem Land. My example was from central Arnhem Land. This is the Ranger Uranium Mine. And um, this is the plant. Um, sorry, this is, that was the, um, this is the plant at Gove, you know, where there was a, a, the original land rights struggle. And um, traditional owners there fought uh, mining, uh, but they lost. And when uh, traditional owners there described that sort of... Um, um, strip mining for bauxite. They talk uh, about graders running across their chests because they have a physical, relational um, con contact with the land. This is another mine, the Ranger Uranium Mine in Western Arnhem Land. And in the background is a very sacred site. And again, people fought against that mine in the late 1970s, and they lost. And that mine's gone ahead. That mine's about to cease production in 2020. There's a $500 million in a rehabilitation fund, and the mining companies told the government that that $500 million is not going to rehabilitate that landscape. They need several times that amount of money. There's a closer example of a closer um, view of the slag heap and the ponds of polluted water at Ranger. I showed this map yesterday, Indigenous land ownership. We have two laws in Australia. In the Northern Territory in the 1970s, Aboriginal land rights law gave people free prior informed consent. It gave people royalty rights. <coughs> It gave them institutions to represent themselves. It gave them a right to veto mining. But in the case of Ranger and um, the bauxite mine in eastern Arnhem Land, these were pre-land rights prospects, so they couldn't be stopped. But since then, in the Northern Territory, this area here, all this land here, people do have a right of veto. Now. The other law that we have is native title law, which talks about where you have the blue, exclusive possession, but you can't exclude miners, and non-exclusive possession, when you just have the same rights as other landowners. And in those situations, you don't have free prime form consent rights. So three decades after land rights law in the 70s, we have weaker laws in the 1990s and 21st century. And Aboriginal people know that. They know that there are differential laws within the same continent. In some places, they have free prime form consent rights. In other places, they just have a right to negotiate. But what that means is that they cannot stop mining. All they can do is negotiate over mining, over the terms and conditions. And uh, despite that, in some cases, people have politically mobilised to stop mines. So 
What we see is diminishing rights in Australia, from land rights in the 1970s, federal law, to federal law in the 21st century, where the broker state was not, able, was not willing to sideline multinational corporations and allow Indigenous people rights over their land. This is just a, a, a map showing registered claims where native title might extend to. This is a very important map that shows currently existing mines in Australia. And there's about 200 operating mines. Very few of them are on Aboriginal titled lands. And if you look at this map, what that shows is mineral prospects. It's not a dot painting. It's actually a, you might not be able to read the key, but it shows mineral deposits according to resource atlas maps produced by the Australian government. And what that shows is that indigenous title lands are currently unexplored and unprospective, but in fact, there are obviously going to be major mineral um, provinces like coal in Queensland, iron ore in the Pilbara, gold in the gold fields. And here's MacArthur River mine with manganese. No, sorry, manganese is up here in Groot Island. MacArthur River mines, lead and zinc. So I just wanted to say. Uh, um, a few things about some of the paradoxes we see in Australia. Despite the fact that people only have a right to negotiate over native tidal lands, there are in fact ways that people mobilise um, discourse around sacredness and around the spiritual connection to the landscape that allow them to win some important battles, not at MacArthur River, but certainly at a place like James Price Point where the local traditional owners were able to make alliances with conservation groups and, in fact, stop a $50 billion uh, gas uh, onshore facility uh, in Western Australia. And, and the way they do that, and we've heard that uh, already, is with um, use, using the leverage of the threat of sovereign risk to investors. So, um, despite the fact that under native title law, you don't have a right to veto, indigenous people are still able to use legal mechanisms and threats of civil action to stop mining. We currently have a major uh, dispute in Australia with an election in two weeks' time about the Adani coal mine, a major coal extraction by an Indian multinational that threatens to pollute the Great Barrier Reef. And none of the major political parties are willing to oppose Adani, despite the fact that it'll be one of the largest coal mines in the world that will help heat the planet because they're frightened of losing um, their um, um, votes in the current election. And, and mining companies very cleverly deploy discourse around jobs, royalties, taxes, to win over neoliberal governments to support, you know, what are crazy projects to extract literally millions of tonnes of black coal and export them to India for the generation of electricity. So what we see in Australia is some wins and some losses. But what we also see, and I think this is in relation to our, our questions around issues, is the way that indigenous people are divided and pitted against each other because they're given differential rights and because some indigenous people participate um, in what Glenn Coulthard has referred to as accumulation by self-dispossession. So indigenous people buy into the rhetoric and the promises of multinational corporations that they will deliver benefit to indigenous communities. At the moment in Australia, mining delivers 6,000 jobs to indigenous people in total across the whole continent, 
and it's most unclear how many of those 6,000 people are actually landowners. Many of those indigenous people are fly-in, fly-out workers from other states that again the mining companies deploy those statistics to demonstrate that they're um, demonstrating good corporate social responsibility to deliver benefits to indigenous communities. But in reality, what they're doing is delivering benefits to indigenous people who live elsewhere and are not the people who've got the rights to speak for country. So I guess the questions that arise that I'd like to end with is, is just asking you know, really hard questions about who benefits and who suffers when mining goes ahead people who see their sacred geography uh, basically desecrated by mining, as against people, non-Indigenous and sometimes Indigenous, who might benefit from mining. The issue of free prior informed consent is really important. Um, and as our speaker said before, if Indigenous people do have free prior informed consent and actually want to consent to mining of their lands, should they be supported by all of us because they are making choices about how to use their lands uh, supposedly for their benefit and hopefully with the right sort of agreements they will actually benefit. What are some of the issues that we face when we see important alliances between conservationists and indigenous landowners? Because when these alliances emerge, as they did at James Price Point, as they did at Jabaluka, as they did at Coronation Hill, three big victories for Indigenous people. They always were based on very strong alliances with conservation groups. And those green-black alliances are sometimes criticised by Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians for uh, allowing conservation groups to manipulate Indigenous landowners to oppose mining of their lands. So the, these are very problematic issues around resource governance and who has the right to speak for country. And in the case of Australia, you know, where we have these, these differential laws, you know, the state has very cleverly developed laws that will disaffect certain indigenous groups, disempower certain indigenous groups and empower others. And the lure of mining royalties equivalents um, which do exist under some laws, are extraordinary temptations for people who are deeply impoverished. As I showed in my slide yesterday, the people who are living most remotely on average in the land are the poorest in income terms in Australian society. And the temptation of allowing mining, especially when mining royalty equivalents are guaranteed as in the Northern Territory, are enormous. Thank you.